Okay, fantastic. Welcome everyone. I'm actually um, going to hand it over to Julia to give you an introduction to kind of the MFA program in general. Thank you, Anza. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, this is the first visiting artist lecture, visiting faculty lecture of the winter 2021 MFA IA residency at SNU. So welcome to all the program participants and to those of you who are not currently program participants, but are fans of the program or fans of Macon and hopefully soon fans of ours. Um, and uh, we have several of these lectures planned for over the course of the next two weeks and we hope you stay tuned and follow along via social media and um, our other um, outlets for information to find out about how to um, hear all of our um, excellent artists talk about their work. Um, I'm very happy that Makin's come back. Makin's taught with us uh, several times um, in the recent past and so we're really privileged to have Makin come and teach again with us this residency. I'm gonna let Anne's introduce Macon and their work, but I will say that um, uh, echoing everyone's um, expressions of uh, sort of remarkable kind of disgust around this moment, um, I am really mad, yeah. <laughs> like really mad. But then I also think um, it's perfect time to hear from Macon about her work and her institutional critique and um, her perspective on how artists can respond to the world. So thank you for being here and thank you for forging on Macon and um, welcome again to everybody. And I hope I see all of you again for the next lecture um, in a few days. So take it away, Anza. Thank you. Fantastic. So. I always like to start our programming virtual or in person with a land acknowledgement. I know that we are all in different places and we're all on indigenous land, but I also want to acknowledge that Sierra Nevada University, which is what's bringing us together, is located on Washoe land and the Washoe people have lived, thrived and stewarded and continue to do so. This land long before the school was here and will continue on into the future. Um, we acknowledge the Washoe people for their care with our land and pay our respects to elders past and present. We keep in our minds and in our hearts the loss of Indigenous lives here and around the world that we are all complicit to. So thank you for that. Um, I will now introduce, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a quick explanation of how this event will work and then I'll introduce Macon and let her kind of take it away. So. When Macon starts, we're gonna invite everyone to turn off their cameras and microphones at that point, and we can focus on Macon's presentation. After her presentation, we'll invite um, you all to turn your cameras and um, audio back on for our Q&A section. Absolutely feel free to um, use the chat during, and if you have any questions, pop them in there. I keep track of them and kind of moderate through um, here, if you don't feel like you want to turn on your microphone, ask the question. So use the chat for chit chatting or for asking questions. Um, and now, why we're all here, Make and Read um, has been involved with the MFAIA program. I was asking her beforehand. She started working with us, not this last summer, not the summer before, but one more before that. And so we are excited to have her here with us through kind of a continuum, like many of our visiting artists and faculty. And as mentioned earlier, she's currently teaching a focus studio practice section called Making Art When the World is on Fire. Um, Macon Reads interdisciplinary projects utilize contemporary sculpture in its broadest sense, spanning installations, site specificity, documentary radio, video performance, social practice, extensive research, collaborative and participatory practices. <laughs> that doesn't sound exciting. I don't know what does. Um, she creates immersive sculptural environments that serve as participatory sites for dynamic inter-community conversations and rituals. Motivated by human relationships within evolving queer and intersectional feminist frameworks, her projects recognize the aesthetic form and social engagement are not mutually exclusive, but rather deeply intertwined. Her work has been showed at a multitude of venues in New York and beyond. She completed her MFA at the University of Illinois at Chicago 
as a university fellow in 2013 and received her BFA from Virginia Commonwealth University in 2007. Additionally, she studied radio documentary at the Salt Institute for Documentary Studies and Physical Theory at the Da International School in Belgrade. All of this to say, Megan is legit and we should be very excited to hear from her during this time. And Super so, <laughs> um, without further ado, I will now hand it over to Megan and invite the rest of us to turn off of our videos and give her the Zoom floor. Great. Thank you so much, Anza. Just taking a second to get set up on the on my end over here. Can everyone see the screen okay? It's just my name right now. <laughs> see yeah. it okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Um, hi everyone. I want to say thank you so much, like everyone said, um, for you coming right now. It's um, probably really hard to even focus in a sense when there's so much going on. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. And when I checked in with Julia and Russell, we decided that um, it's important to kind of keep doing, um, doing our thing and living our lives and not letting these people sort of like throw it off that much. But I want to acknowledge it's a crazy time. Um, also, I'm not sure who has um who maybe in terms of the cycle of students uh was there for my last talk so sorry if this is redundant for some of you um but i always like to start my talks with um a reference to a super cheesy uh children's movie um i would normally if we were in a regular room i would ask you to raise your hands if you've seen the never ending story um but i'll put it out there that this movie um you can see it came out in 1984 it gave me what I would call my first existential crisis as a kindergartner. Um, I saw this movie and freaked out about this idea of the nothing that I'm going to tell you about. Um, and I wasn't allowed to watch movies with the kids at school anymore uh, and had to play Connect Four with my back turned to the TV because I was the sensitive kid officially sort of, you know. Um, but the reason that this movie affected me a lot and the reason I reference it at the beginning of the artist talk is that I think it's got a really powerful analogy in it. Um, so for people who haven't seen The Never Ending Story or need a refresher, uh, basically there's this um, there's this land called Fantasia in, in the movie, um, which is the realm of sort of all of human fantasies and dreams and imagination. So like every character and every story that you've ever seen um, or heard of all live in the same land. And in the film, it's slowly kind of getting eaten up and disappearing. Um, and what you realize, uh, especially when I went back as an adult, um, I realized this was so intense is that um, it's not actually even actively eating you up so much as that if you stay in its presence, you kind of forget who you are um, and you start seeing the world in black and white and you get spat out into the human world and you start sort of telling lies that support this thing called the nothing. And what the nothing is trying to do um, in the film and the, and the book is that um, basically the, the wolf that's helping the nothing um, talks about in the movie that the people without dreams and without hopes and without imagination are easier to control. Um, and whoever has control over people therefore, you know, has power over them. Um, and the reason that I, I, this feels especially important right now is we can kind of see the way that, um, that people have gotten into this black and white thinking um, and the world has gotten really flat and we, um, maybe in some ways our imaginations are running wild with conspiracy theories and things, some people's, but in many ways it seems like we've really lost our way. Um, and I believe right now art can feel like WTF, why am I making art? You know, what uh, the world's on fire, you know, it feels urgent and important. And I would argue that actually in these times, um, there's a deeper sense of responsibility and care that we as artists um, have for, for trying to imagine and, and create a better world. So um, I'll kind of get off my never ending story soapbox, but that's kind of the, a big thing that sort of drives my practice is thinking about um, what I can as an artist bring into the world that might address you know, a need that I have or also that hopefully connects to other people. Um, so for the first project I'll start um, with, I, a couple of people were fans of this yesterday, which was really sweet to hear about. Um, I'm gonna talk about my project called Eulogy for the Dyke Bar. Um, and primarily because I feel like this is the project that really changed my practice. It kind of brought together my background in, um, you know, organizing and activism from when I was younger and sculpture um, and performance. 
And I was able to, for the first time, really find a need that felt um, important in my community in a way that I didn't even realize um, and kind of make a project that did something about it. So um, in, sh in short, basically, the, um, this, is, uh, it's a, this is the first time that the project happened at a place called Wayfarers Gallery in Brooklyn. Um, and you can see it's set up um, so that people on the street might pass it by and just see these signs that say, you know, Dyke Bar in the window. Um, and it's happened a bunch of times now, actually. The, the first time, um, its first international trip happened this year. Unfortunately, I couldn't go because of COVID in Sydney, Australia. So um, the idea of this project is that, and I can show you some more slides of it. Um, this is the interior of the space. Um, but this project came about because, you know, I'm a, I'm a queer womanish person um, in the world. And I found myself living in Chicago and really, um, being sad that there weren't places for me to go and meet other queer feminine spectrum people. Um, they had the, the kind of queer neighborhood in Chicago is called Boys Town. And um, that's exactly what it felt like. Um, and so I thought, you know, why, why is that? Why can't I find these spaces? Um, and so to describe this image um, before I go on for you, this is the inside of the first iteration of the, the space. Um, and I, I decided to kind of just make a dike bar and then have conversations um, through the process of making it and then within the dike bar itself that might help me understand this. Um, and for students in my class last night when we were talking about making a project that addresses a need or uses a need to um, kind of lead the project, um, this is totally an example of it because by I basically made the community that I needed through this project. Um, so I went to a bunch of dike bars and I looked around to see, um, you know, what was inside of them. Um, and, you know, mostly they're like any other bar, um, but um, I like to listen to stories with people about them and they often centered the pool table. There were lots of dramatic stories of fights and different things breaking out around the pool table. Um, so I went ahead and just sort of made some of the things that I saw in these bars. It was fun research. I just hung out at bars and watched people. Um, so uh, this image, for example, this is a dartboard. Um, and I want to point out that this, this background um, is actually, it's hand painted with this tool called a wood grainer, which I just always think is so cool. Um, so when you go into the space, it's like it's referencing all of these things that you might see from an actual dike bar, but it's also clearly not, you know, quote, real. Um, everything is lumpy. Um, I like things that are lumpy. I like to be able to see that a human being made um, made the thing, sorry, um, that you're looking at. And so all the materials I'm using are a lot of paper mache, cardboard, um, a lot of things that um, I try to use things that are more recyclable or biodegradable when I can. Obviously the colors I use are deeply, um, <laughs> fluorescent, so I wouldn't call them biodegradable, but um, a lot of that, you know, goes into some of these choices. So um, just showing you some of the, the sort of objects in the space. Um, and before I go on to the next slide, I guess I'll say that, um, maybe I'll go back to this one because it's nicer to, to look at. Um, but one of the things that I started coming into over and over again when I was asking people about dike bars, why, why they don't exist anymore is, even from my queerest queers in my life, there were all of these stereotypes about, about dykes and, and feminine spectrum people like not being as cruisy, not being, not liking to party, not being as sexual, not being as, you know, that we kind of all want to like, um, what did the person say? Like hang out at home and drink tea and bake bread and, and pet our cats, right? And I'm like, there's nothing wrong with drinking tea and baking bread and petting cats, but some of us do other things too. Um, and so I started looking into that and I found that there were actually um, so many hidden sort of socioeconomic differences um, and reasons that there were not as many dike bars in the first place um, and that things like gentrification hit these spaces harder. So um, I'll go into that a little bit more, but zooming along, um, I wanted to show you this too. Um, this is a, a, just a statement that went ahead and was like published on anything that had to do with the project. Um, and to read it, it just says, Eulogy for the Dyke Bar uses the reclaimed term dyke in its most expansive sense and recognizes that gender and identities are complex and fluid. If you've identified with a term or an experience of feminine spectrum queerness in the past or present or perhaps future, um, or you feel an affiliation or allyship with dyke culture, you're welcome and valued at the dyke bar. Um, and the reason for that is that it was really important to me that this project be an inclusive, um, an inclusive space and that people knew that, um, that I was addressing the, 
the idea of what even a dyke bar is at this point in terms of this moment where there's been so much incredible gender expansion to even think about like, you know, the, the words that we're using to describe the project. So um, I tried to make it clear that um, anyone who felt like the dyke bar was for them um, was welcome there. Um, when you see these um, images here, these were also an important part of the space. So the space kind of functioned in two ways, right? There was the the sort of during the gallery hours, you could come in, see the sculptures, see the space, um, and then look at these archival images. And then during other times when the bar was activated, um, we had all sorts of events and programs in there, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but that that's something that's important to my practice is when I was a student and socially engaged art, social practice was kind of a thing that people were more actively talking about or canonizing um, even. Um, there was a lot of conversation about social practice being kind of over here and studio work being over here as if they were at odds. And, and I really try to use my work combined to combine studio, social practice and research um, together because I actually find that they all really enhance each other. So I, I think of each element in this project as equally important, even if you might see the visual components more in this, in this talk. Um, so in the background, um, you can see here all of these different archival images that um, that I spent time at the Lesbian Hersphere Archives with these kind of grumpy, nice older dykes, um, just going through these crazy boxes. Um, it's, it's a brownstone in, um, in Brooklyn with very little funding, um, but it's an incredible archive if you ever get to go again, it's called the Lesbian Hersphere Archives. Um, and what's cool about it is that they don't just archive sort of quote important dykes or important queer people there. Um, if your partner passes away and you wanna take all of their stuff and drop it off at the archive, um, they will take it and it might be kind of crazy in there, but they will find a place for it and, and include it within this larger archive. Um, so it's really kind of like a sort of people's archive in a way that was really great. Um, and so to continue that, that line of thought earlier when I was saying, you know, these sort of stereotypes and things, um, one thing that I realized is that um, I'm going to use binary language here because it's kind of how we know this information, but um, just recognizing that that's sort of a problem in itself. But historically, men and women have made um, different amounts of money, right? And we know that. And, um, and then once you factor in race, it, that sort of inequity grows so much more, right? So, um, so women's spaces have historically like always been hit harder by gentrification. Women have not had as much income um, to be able to spend, um, to go out on these, into these spaces. And there used to be laws in the book, um, the books in different states, for example, um, that said you couldn't, if you were a woman, you could not go to a bar period without a man. You couldn't order a drink without a man. Um, so there are all these sort of hidden things, right, that make these spaces harder. Um, and then there's another component, which I think is important to acknowledge is that um, women not only got paid less per the same job, but we also couldn't have the same job. So um, for example, the more feminine or femme um, person in a, a sort of traditional butch femme partnership back in the 50s, um, she might be able to get a job, but it's going to be a very low paying job that's assumed to be supplemental to her husband's income. And then the sort of more quote butch person um, or maybe more gender non-conforming non-binary person um, they will, they wouldn't be able to maybe get a job at all or, or would be very underemployed. So um, it was usually the femme back then who was often the breadwinner and not able to bring a lot of home, uh, money home. So just sort of foregrounding that to understand this issue that was sort of central to the project, right? Um, and so some of these, these are images from the archives that we got when you, on the top left here, um, it says, you can see this sort of awkward language, um, a place for gay women, biological or otherwise. I, I bring that in because I think it's a great, um, early example of, of an attempt at trans inclusive language from the 90s um, in a bar called Nanny's in, um, in Manhattan, um, in New York. And on the right here, this is a flyer from Cinnamon Spice Productions. They were a um, primarily women of color um, production company that basically um, threw parties at different bars. Um, the card at the bottom, official muff driver, was something that um, you needed to show to get into a bar in Northampton, Massachusetts. So on the reason that I included all these different things is because I just wanted to have a sense of the sort of historical framework for these spaces. Um, these pictures, um, some of them are from the Lexington, like the top right one, which is um, the last uh, dike bar that closed, that was in San Francisco, which closed. There's actually not currently um, a dike owned dike focused um, sort of dyke community bar left in San Francisco. There's not one. Um, 
which a lot of people don't realize like how much these spaces are almost completely gone from the US now. Um, the picture down in the right, I think is worth noting is, is really special and rare because um, it used to be that if you got caught in one of these bars, um, they would round you up um, and take your picture, put it in the, in the paper, and then basically the next day everyone would find out that you were gay um, and you would potentially lose your job, your family, um, everything. So um, it was really hard to find, find earlier pictures. And you'll see that I've, I've printed everything black and white because I wanted to just have a sense of um, kind of flattening time. So you would walk up and not quite know what you were looking at and have to kind of put it together and, um, and weave these, these different things together. So um, here is an example of an article reporting after the Duchess um, was raided by the police. There were a lot of police raids for a long time. Um, community flyer to try to keep the Duchess open. It is now a donut shop in the West Village. Um, on the right here, um, this is a flyer from 1979, a dyke bar that was in San Francisco after um, some police came and beat up some of the patrons. They're trying to do something about it. So there's just a tremendous amount of harassment and things that we really take for granted now. Um, and I would say that, that that is another piece of the sort of answer for why these spaces are closing that, that I think is really interesting is the question of what assimilation does to a community. Because now, um, as someone once said in one of the, the, the events that we had, um, you know, in a lot of places, if you're queer, you can go with your partner to, to Applebee's now, you know, you can go anywhere. Um, and um, you don't need to go to the special dyke bar. Um, and so in this way with, with queer liberation, um, we're granted access to all these spaces, but are they spaces we even want? You know, is Applebee's where we want to end up? Um, is a good question, you know. So so what what do we gain and lose through assimilation? Um, and the last image I'll show you, I believe, is um just this post from the from Lila, who used to own the um the Lexington, the bar I mentioned before. And she's just basically talking about um things like gentrification and the change in her neighborhood and the rent, um, and that's why. Um, she had to close the space. It was a, a pretty big loss to the community. Um, and so if you were in the bar, you would see that next to, um, you know, uh, a letter from an owner of a bar in 1981 closing for the same reasons. Um, a sip of tea. Um, so um, when I was doing this, I had a lot of feelings about it, and I was working alone all the time at this residency. Um, the residency was actually in this little gallery, you can see the, that says Wayfarers. Um, they, it was a great opportunity, it was a residency that um, you could work right in their gallery the whole summer, so I got to build right in the space. Um, and I want to advocate too that as someone who was just coming out of grad school, it was so important for me to apply to places and opportunities that were not like sort of big fancy ones that everybody knew about. Um, but smaller, scrappier, more DIY and collective spaces because um, people there were always more excited about I was, what I was doing and the competition wasn't as crazy to, to get these opportunities. And, um, and I think that, that spaces like Wayfair has really made a huge difference in my career. Um, so anyway, I was, I was working on this. I thought, oh, I'm so much work. It's so hot. There's no air conditioning. I can't leave the windows open. What am I doing? Like, nobody's gonna care. You know, maybe a few people will come to my show. Um, and then lo and behold, we, we posted some information about it online and I um, collaborated with a group called Queer Memoir to do an event um, in the space. And so on our opening night, suddenly we had a, this line. I just think it's crazy, like a line around the block for two hours to get into a dyke themed um, event at a gallery that nobody really knew about in a part of Brooklyn people didn't go to to see art. So. Um, it was really wild to me um, and really inspiring. We had a thousand people RSVP on the page and we had to um, live stream the event and the storytelling elsewhere. And it was just the, this time where I was like, oh, this is what happens when things line up and, and you um, make work about something that, that you, know, you might even not even realize, you might feel really alone with the issue that it's facing. But when you make work that connects to a story beyond yourself, right? To a larger thing that a community is struggling, sometimes, um, it can, it just really does something different. So I was, I'm still floored by this, um, this image and the situation. Um, sorry, I just have some pretty pixelated images from the inside that night, um, but you can see that the space actually became a bar, a dyke bar, right? Um, we had drinks with names of things like, um, I think we had like butch tears and um, you could get a, a muff diver with white wine. I remember somebody being able to order. We just had like funny drink names. Um, 
and the space just kind of served its actual function, um, right? And then we also had a whole bunch of events inside of the space. So the first one was um, was this collaboration with Queer Memoir. I want to point out too that this is Shelley Weiss. She's an amazing activist. Um, in her 70s, she's when we did a trivia night, she basically won because every question we asked um, was about something she had organized or attended. Um, and she's so sneaky. Look at the shirt that she is wearing. I did this presentation so many times without realizing that there's like a seventh grade humor um, joke happening in there. But anyway, um, so the eulogy ritual was basically just a series of people, um, all sorts of genders um, and ages and, and backgrounds um, speaking about what a dyke bar was um, and, and or not even what about a dyke bar was, I should say what a dyke bar had been in their lives, um, telling stories about dyke bars, telling stories about hooking up with people or organizing things or um, just whatever. Um, and, and the idea was that through this storytelling, um, we could also kind of um, bring people into a room who basically, I, I, for people who haven't spent a lot of time in queer communities, um, or maybe this is just a duh for everyone, but there's, there are a lot of different intersecting identities and there's a lot of trauma um, coming from different experiences and, um, and generationally right now, but also forever, um, queers often fight with each other because the difference between what someone like Shelley experienced when she was young and what was available to her in terms of an experience of gender or what the world might, might look like is so radically different um, than, than where I am, let alone someone who's 10 years younger than me. So something else I was thinking about with this project was like, how can I use my art to create a space where people can um, come together and share space and have some healing around these sort of generational divides around ideas of gender and things. For the record, Shelley's like super on it, trans ally, um, really radical, wonderful human. Um, but, you know, basically like a lot of times younger queers, well, I should zoom back. There was one time that kind of exemplified the situation to me when I was at the Lesbian Herstory Archives, I found this journal and it was a bunch of people yelling at each other, basically pre-internet, so like on typed paper. Um, and they were like, I'm not a dyke, I'm a lesbian. And the other ones were like, I'm not a lesbian, I'm a dyke, you know, or whatever. And, um, and I was like, wow, we have been fighting each other around these things for so long. And often the conversations can be really fruitful um, and move forward. And sometimes they can just be really flattening and we cannot see each other. Um, and so one thing I loved about this project was a lot of younger queer people got to, um, listen to elders talk about what their their experiences were like. Um, and actually, before moving on to this panel, one more thing um, that I that I thought was amazing. I don't have her picture here, but one of the one of the people who spoke was named Jay Toole, and um, she's an older dyke, um, I think almost 80 now. Um, she's had a lot of head injuries from being beat up by the police a lot. Um, and she told a story about living, she was basically living as um, a houseless person um, uh, in the park across from Stonewall when the uprising happened. She was there for a lot of that stuff. She had these wild stories, but the reason she'd been beat up by the police so much is that it used to be that if you didn't wear at least three pieces of what the police considered to be gender appropriate clothing after they assess you know, what they think your gender should be, um, they could just pick you up and put you in jail. Um, and so if you looked queer, you looked out of line and you didn't have those three pieces of gender appropriate clothing on, thrown into jail. And um, one of the things that Jay told me that I thought was wild was these stories about these, you know, that's also how she met the other queer people. You know, now we have like all the apps and all the things, so we don't even realize. Um, but, you know, she would get thrown in jail and then they would take the, the filters from cigarettes um, and slip them into the lock. Um, for the cell and then once the guards were gone they would sneak out and they'd go and make out with each other or whatever and it was a way for queers to meet each other um, but that always stands out to me um, you know just uh, she was saying when she got up there how important it was for her to see all of the queer people there and um, and to be heard by them so there were just some really incredible moments um, in this project that you know I'm, I, I'm really grateful for um, so moving forward the project was then um, Sorry, again, this is a sort of blurry image. This was before I was taking good documentation, always note to self, get good documentation. Um, but the project was invited to happen at Pulse New York, which was the opposite of a small scrappy space in Brooklyn. It was a very fancy art fair with a lot of critical things to think about art fairs. Um, and, uh, you know, in Manhattan, 
flashy, shiny objects, um, but also an incredible opportunity over the four days that this um, that the dive bar happened there. We had a bunch of programming, um, and literally thousands. I think I think close to five thousand people came through, and um, the dive bar was the only bar. So all of these straight people also had to figure out. Can I go into this bar if I want to drink? It says Dyke Bar, you know, and they would have to kind of come in and negotiate the space. So I think it was um, it was interesting, and we did a lot of work to try to make it continue to be inclusive. So, um, you know, people who couldn't afford the fee to get into the art fair didn't pay it. We did a lot of stuff around accessibility in the space, and um, and anyway, so it was an, an interesting thing to suddenly change and to think about. Um, this is a panel that I had um, between people who um, currently throw queer kind of gender everybody roving parties in Chicago that happen at different bars. Um, uh, Lisa Canastrasi, who's the um, owner of the longest running dyke bar in New York, um, was on this panel. Um, and a couple historians um, and basically like people who had different aspects and um and interests i guess in their in their worlds around queer spaces and the kind of newer party model versus the older um, brick and mortar bar space um and again just to point out another sort of strategy around inclusion um i made sure that um in order to make sure that the space felt um that the conversation kind of stayed on track um i had a, a close friend of mine who was also a trans woman um, lead the panel um, so that she was able, and we had a lot of conversations about what would make her feel comfortable doing that and everything beforehand. So um, sort of centering um, one of the, the people that I uh, want to make sure feels comfortable in the space. Um, and I've learned that if you have a panel, it's always good to not just have academics on it because panels often take really interesting things and turn them into boring, boring things. And I don't know how it happens. So this panel was actually really great. And I think it's because we had some historians like Jack who's speaking there with some party people. And um, it, so it sort of was, um, it was, it was an interesting experience. Um, I also thought a lot about how to, let me see how we're doing on time. Um, I also thought a lot about how to use this moment of suddenly having, I'd never had a show that big before. I never had that much exposure. And I thought, how can I use my project as a platform to support other projects? Um, kind of like share the love instead of, you know, we have so much scarcity in, in the art world where we feel like we have to compete with each other for the few resources we have. And I really wanna change that model. Um, so the, this is a photo from um, a group called Last Call New Orleans. Um, and they do both a podcast, if you wanna nerd out on Dyke Bar history, um, especially from the seventies to the nineties in New Orleans. Um, they do a podcast on that and they also do a bunch of theater stuff. They're really great. So we had a couple members of their group um, actually come and perform a section of one of their plays in the Dyke Bar at Calls. Oh. So bringing their voices in, um, there were also some other things I can tell you about at some point, um, some other groups that we brought in. Um, but these were sort of the um, sort of central questions that I wanted to acknowledge that I think about when I'm pulling something like this together were people from different communities um, who maybe have like different amounts of privilege than I have or um, might have some concerns or anxiety about participating in something that is sort of oriented around dyke space. Um, or really any project, um, because I, I think these apply to the, the project I'm about to share with you after this. Um, but so when I, when I think about socially engaged art, a lot of times I'm sort of hesitant to sort of even be connected with what we call social practice, even though there are a lot of incredible social practice artists. And it's because there's a lot of tendency to kind of have a person come in, especially if it's a white person, to a community and kind of just do what they think the community needs, um, have a project, take some pictures, and they have a great story to tell in their artist talk afterwards. And I thought, I really don't want to kind of be part of that cycle. Um, I really want to make sure that my relationships are not transactional um, and that the work can have as, as much ability to sort of move forward um, and, and have an impact as possible. So these are some of the questions I ask them. You know, how can participation be mutually beneficial if I'm going to invite anyone to be a part of my project? Um, how can I establish trust with them? Um, a lot of times this means just going out to coffee with someone and being like, hey, here's my project. Here's what I'm thinking about. What do you think? Um, you know, what, what can I do to kind of like compensate you for, for coming? Sometimes that means paying them money if I have money. Um, sometimes it means um, 
doing something else like with Theater They Press New York, a group I worked on with another project I'll show you in a minute. Um, I just went and volunteered, you know, three times for one of them to come and speak once um, some hours at their organization. So there are all sorts of ways besides paying money that you can think about um, making sure that you're giving back. Um, and then what are the concerns, what are their concerns about being in the space um, and anything that might come up and be hard? Um, and the important one here is what actions can I commit to ahead of time if any of those, if any of those things happen? So, um, you know, instead of being like, oh, someone asked you a question that maybe felt a little bit um, transphobic, racist, misogynist, yucky, blech. Um, instead of being like, I know what you're gonna need then, um, we talk about it ahead of time. And, um, and that way people can tell me like, I would want you to say something. I would want you to not say something. Um, and so, you know, I found that just by having those agreements um, in place ahead of time, um, you know, a lot of work gets done to, to kind of create a, a really good feeling space when people come into it. Um, and I should say too, on the side as an artist um, and just a human, um, you know, whenever you're doing work with, with, with other human beings and relationships, like stuff can come up that's hard sometimes. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're doing something wrong. It can be kind of an opportunity for growth. Um, but, but it really takes a lot of, um, of just considering other people and, and what you're asking them to do. Um, so that being said, oh yes, I have one more slide about this. This is my favorite thing about the Dyke Bar project that happened actually is that, um, inspired by the project, but like completely not part of anything that I was organizing. Uh, this group called New York City um, Dyke Bar Takeover um, started organizing takeovers of straight bars um, for dykes and having things like the storytelling sessions and stuff inside of them. Um, and so um, this project has been happening, I guess, since 2015 now. Um, and this is an example of like, if you do something that connects to an issue that other people are feeling or experiencing, then sometimes you get to see your project actually kind of like continue to have an impact beyond its own doors um, and, and be able to kind of, um, I want to say grow legs, but I'm trying to think of a less able, ableist thing, but you know, grow something to move it forward. So that's just an exciting thing. Um, I'm not sure, I guess I'll keep going through with this project. Um, and then um, have some time for questions. I might, might have spent longer on the dike bar. Um, so if Enza or anybody wants to let me know time-wise if I need to switch, um, just let me know. But um, the next project I'll talk about is called Oppressing Conference. Um, I did this so different than a dike bar. Um, I definitely wasn't thinking at the time like, oh yeah, I, I know the next project, <laughs> the next big project I do will involve an American flag and a presidential seal. Um, but uh, I, I made this in response to the 2016 election. Um, I was really, really worried about the country and, um, and what was starting to happen under the Trump administration. I felt like there were so many bad things happening in the news um, every day, like the pulling out of the climate accord, um, the DACA stuff, um, the things going on with family separation. I mean, it was just so much. Um, and I wasn't sure as an artist what I sort of would have permission or like what would be appropriate for me to speak to in terms of like, am I the one to make an artist project about immigration, given my experience, or is that better for someone else, etc. And I kept thinking also, if I make a project about any of these things, um, the cycle is happening so fast that by the time I finish making the sculpture, we'll be on to like 10 million other doom things. So <clears throat> I kept looking at kind of like, what's the underneath this, all of this. And I started reading books about um, kind of the rise of authoritarianism and how often <clears throat> when that happens, um, the, the sort of authoritarian leaders will start to attack the idea of the truth um, and specifically to attack the press um, and to um, use that as a way to disorient people and kind of fracture conversations. So we end up in a world where we don't have shared facts and, um, and get really polarized. Today is a great day to acknowledge that, right? Um, so, Suddenly I found myself going, okay, I think I need to build the White House press briefing room in cardboard and paper mache and my usual colors. Um, and I'll kind of figure out what to do from there. So this is the space, it's life size. Um, it's a little bit, the, the camera was, um, there was a lot of light when we took this picture. And so it's actually more sort of day glow fluorescent in the same realm as the dike bar um, in real life. Um, 
same simple sort of materiality. Um, everything's made out of cardboard um, and paper mache, um, uh, paper clay, which is kind of like paper mache, but it's it's, it's kind of like it got put up in a blender and, and you can just um, move it smooth and onto things. Um, on the left here where I made this flag, this is actually just muslin, the cheapest fabric I could get at the fabric store, um, covered in house paint. And I like the way that when you painting up layers of that house paint on it, it starts to look like paper. Um, so I really like this sort of, again, this aesthetic of things that are lumpy, that you can see the hand in, um, that aren't trying to, um, to be super precious. Um, and also I should say that, you know, it's part of why I work that way too is, um, sorry, is, uh, is that I'm, I'm sort of impatient. I like to work fast, you know? Um, and so I've sort of accepted like, that's just, that's just how I am as a maker. I like to, I like things that are quick and tactile and I can kind of mush them together and make them happen. Um, so I built this out um, and I kept thinking like, okay, so what's gonna happen in this thing? And then I read this book called um, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century by Timothy Snyder. Um, and I don't know if people have read this book, but um, it's small. Timothy Snyder is a really well-known scholar who's written about the Holocaust and the rise of the Third Reich, but also the Soviet Union. Um, and he's really interested in this sort of psychology of, of what happens inside people for, um, for authoritarian um, regimes and states to be able to come and exist. So he wrote this book within 10 days after Trump had been elected. Um, on the plane, freaking out. Um, it's really short and he just wanted you to have a sense of um, kind of what you might be able to do if you're an average person and wanted a really accessible text. So I read it and I thought, these are <clears throat> these are 11 of the 20 prompts that he gives you. Um, but I thought, oh, I can use these prompts as a sort of curatorial framework to start organizing um, performative press conferences for the project. Um, so what I did was the first night, um, you can see the audience sitting there. Um, there's one white guy's head with gray hair floating in the right there. That's actually Timothy Snyder who came. Um, pro tip that I learned from this is that if you want to um, get an academic who writes some important book to be part of your project, often um, they might not respond to you if you're another academic, but if you're a weirdo artist, they're like, ooh, you're a creative, and they'll like come and be part of your project. So Timothy came and spoke that night. Um, and then I had a number of other speakers come and basically um, share some of the work that they do or the thoughts that they have um, in relationship to one of those prompts. So this is my friend Mimi Onooha. Um, she's an amazing artist, thinker, um, tech writer. Um, she's kind of, she's a very interdisciplinary, um, smart weirdo, um, which we know to appreciate in this program, right? Um, and so she had created the zine um, in part because um, we had a lot of jokes about me being a Luddite and, um, and, and liking things made out of paper. So um, she ended up making this zine uh, that was basically about how to um, figure out which different tactics were being used in the media to get you to think different things and to kind of be able to, to investigate on your own um, and look into the information you were getting from the news. Um, so she, she talked about that and that would be the prompt. Um, I forget which number it is. Yes, 11, investigate. Um, and then the person on the right here, uh, Reynaldo Piniella, he is um, a, an artist um, and primarily an actor. Um, and he had just attended a place called the Artist Campaign School. So he came and talked about his experience at the Artist Campaign School um, and gave us an example of a stump speech, which is kind of like your, your platform speech when you're running for office. The Artist Campaign School basically was an interesting group because they realized in response to the 2016 election also that artists are really smart, weird thinkers who like uh, who who really care about things but don't quite know where to direct sometimes our our ideas into society um, in terms of a sort of political sense. So they started um, getting funding and things to teach artists how to run campaigns locally um, for office. And so Ronaldo had been running for. Um, for local office. And so he sort of talked us through that. I'm trying to remember exactly which prompt his was. Um, it might have been practice corporeal politics. I did so many of these now, I can't quite remember them all. But um, this was kind of the first um, iteration of a pressing conference. Since then, um, oh yeah, there's Timothy Snyder doing his thing. 
Um, since then, it's happened a bunch of places. I'm so sorry I'm, this picture is not blowing up well here. Um, the next place where we did the project was called Spring Break. Um, it's, a, it's, it's the art fair out of all the art fairs in New York that I like the most because it tends to be more scrappy. There's a lot more interdisciplinary and political work um, in it. Um, but so during the two weeks that, um, or the one week that the fair was open, um, I curated a bunch of performances, um, all sorts of different people. Like my friend in the bottom middle there, Mackenzie Zev, um, is a queer rabbinical student now rabbi um, who talked about the, um, the sort of uh, various um, traditions within Judaism of um, prayer as protest um, and ritual as protest and led us in some really beautiful songs. Um, and then these other pictures are actually all just um, people who came up and then during the sort of open mic hours um, were able to get up behind the, the podium. Some people just got really into posing, but um, I really tried to get people to speak and to basically speak back to the White House. Like we have all of this sort of um, information being shoved at us by the White House through this, this White House press briefing room. And the question was kind of like, what would you like to say in response? Or what do you wish was being said from that platform that isn't? Um, and then everyone could collect it with this hashtag um, and share that. So if you ever want, you can go um, on Instagram and look at the, the hashtag A Pressing Conference, um, not O Pressing Conference, A Pressing Conference. And, um, and you can see some of the things that people posted. Um, but I really wanted, you know, this, this idea, I like, I'm, I'm not a huge social media person, but I really like the idea that people would be scrolling through their, um, their phone and see this image that was like, that's the press briefing room. No, it's clearly not. And that there would be this sort of moment of flattening um, the sort of illusion of power that this random room in this one building has in our lives. Um, so um, there's Mackenzie giving their speech. Um, this is a friend of mine, Achilles Holiday, who came in. Um, he is a dancer and he basically, he was doing the prompt to make small talk and eye contact. And he walked into the room. He never said a word. He just started dancing and he got everyone to eventually dance with him. Um, and I loved it because this was another, um, a different way of approaching one of those topics because I didn't want everything to be sort of a political lecture. That's why, you know, Mackenzie did their um, ritual and, and Achilles to this dance is that um, to, to have different ways to get people to um, like maybe some people are into dance and some people are into politics and some people are into Judaic traditions um, but if they come to this thing for that they might see these other things and there would be this sort of cross-pollinating of ideas but um, but I loved Achilles's because we actually did make eye contact and small talk um, which was one of Snyder's prompts um, because people under authoritarianism sometimes get scared and stop talking to each other. Um, a couple other examples, it was invited to um, Brooklyn um, to Brick to their open fest um, and, and we were able to have a bunch of speakers that I curated and then also Mahogany Brown who's in the center there with the Howard sweatshirt. She curated a bunch of um, uh, spoken word and music events inside the installation. Um, and that was all brought, uh, broadcast on BRIC's um, public access TV channel. So um, one thing that's important about these projects is I like them to be able to adapt and flex to each, each place that they go and kind of serve a new, um, a new role. So um, I really love being able to hand over the, the platform and walk in and go, I don't know who's going to be speaking today. Um, you know, it was, it was fun. And on the left here is a student speaking at um, Teachers College at Columbia University. Um, there was a big exhibition about um, different ideas in uh, pedagogical approaches in education. And they invited me to be a part of it and all the students were able to get up behind the podium and speak about different things they thought were really important in education. Um, and we recorded all of them professionally. Um, and then basically there was a student liaison whose job was to um, be in direct contact with New York senators. So Chuck Schumer and uh, Kristen Gillibrand um, were actually shown um, a selected group of videos that the students made voicing their concerns. Um, so this was a place where the sort of interestingly full circle, um, we actually did take messages spoken from this podium and directly um, uh, share them with, with people in the government. So um, it's just another way that the the project, um, uh, you know, kind of took place. And this person actually on the left here is, um, uh, that was one of the most intense moments from the podium. Um, he got up there and had a lot to say because he had just lost his um, partner to gun violence in Chicago. Um, and so he 
like the, the day before. Um, and so it's interesting how these spaces can kind of become um, sort of therapeutic in ways you wouldn't expect. Um, one of the last iterations of the project was um, that I worked with a professor at Montclair State University named Livia Alexandra. And um, we basically created a curriculum um, based around this project. So again, I handed the podium over, you know, I went and set it up in the museum and everything. And I worked with the students over the semester, but they did a lot of writing about the things that they were most, um, you know, most upset about and, and what they really cared about. Um, and then created their own speeches um, to practice giving from the podium. But then from there um, kind of got grouped into to four areas that they, thematic areas that they cared about. And I think it was climate change, mental health, gender, and race and immigration. Um, and then they were tasked with um, going out into their communities and finding people to speak about those issues. So in the end, we presented the, the project at the museum for a night and these students got to um, basically uh, curate the whole night of performances and speakers about things that they cared about. Um, and again, I had a sense of what was gonna happen, but it was still sort of a surprise. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> breathing in my water. Um, but so um, these are just to show you that the same project can happen a bunch of different ways. And depending on what the point of the project is, you can really change um, your role as author versus organizer versus facilitator um, within that context. How am I doing on time, you guys? Oops, I should probably finish. Is Anza, Julia, should I talk about another project? I think if you're good, you, you should. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what Anza's time frame is, but I would yeah. say. I didn't know exactly when we started either after introductions and stuff. Yeah. Um, Okay. Have until well, three thirty. We have until three thirty, so you can use the time however you you want. Fabulous. Okay, so I'll 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 go through this one kind of more quickly. Um, so kind of like on tyranny, I, I I joke about this, but I feel like sometimes my projects are just these like super elaborate book reports. <laughs> I'm kind of a nerd, but um, this is another book. I think the cover is terrible, um, but. Um, this book really blew my mind and, and changed the way that I saw the world a lot. And when I read it, I thought, oh my God, I want everyone to read this. Um, so in short, Caliban and the Witch um, is about a 300 year period in Europe um, when a bunch of things were happening, but essentially there was a slow change from feudalism into what we would call capitalism now, like early capitalism. Um, during that time, there was also the bubonic plague, which I've been thinking about this moment for us a lot now, um, because something that happens with plagues and viruses and these pandemics and things as we know now, um, is that historically over and over again, there's lots of social unrest. They, they kind of make all of the weak spots in our culture and our systems bare and then, we have to deal with it. Um, and so um, one of the things that was happening back then is there were these places where there were, you know, a third of the labor force, um, up to two thirds um, had died under this new system. People had been pushed off of common lands. They had to work for wages and um, this big change. And then a whole bunch of people died. So then the workers that were left um, basically had um, more ability to push for being treated better. Um, they started agitating for all sorts of things. Um, and so weirdly, what happened to women during that time um, was that they suddenly were under massive um, pressure to make babies um, because they, we needed bodies in the field to do stuff, right? And so um, interestingly, a lot of our ideas about um, gender and what's sexy and what's not sexy and all sorts of things come um, from this period in time because this is also like ramping up right before Europe starts to really colonize and push um, its, its culture on a lot of the world. So um, during that time um, with all this pressure on women and also um, all these big changes that were happening economically, structurally, so much death and unknown things, um, women started, mostly women, 85% of the people who were killed were women, um, started being persecuted as witches. Um, they believed all sorts of crazy, crazy things. Um, and um, these images are from that time, you know, this, this woman in the courtroom being scary with her lightning hands and this 
this woman on the side here um, feeding her secret creatures in a box. There's not an image of it available that I have, but there was a belief back then actually that um, witches kept um, penises, like a box full of a bunch of penises in a box in, the, in their house. They would um, feed them oats late at night. And I don't know what they did with them after that, but people had, I mean, it's, it's interesting because there's a wild imagination. Um, but um, some of our ideas about fertility um, in terms of like, it used to be before this period, the sort of emphasis on youth as beauty um, wasn't as strong because um, women weren't, the, the focus wasn't so intensely on fertility. And also um, in this period, um, uh, this is one of the times when homosexuality actually became officially a sin under the church because um, it wasn't about um, procreative sex, right? So a lot of things that we, conversations around abortion, um, midwifery, and all sorts of practices, uh, herbal medicine, et cetera, um, are still playing out affected by this time period. Um, and so, sorry, these images are intense, but um, at points there were, uh, people don't know how many people were killed, but it was, um, well, it was hundreds of thousands, they believe. Um, and there were some areas, particularly in Scotland, um, where there were actually villages where there were almost no women left um, because so many women were killed. And, um, and so these are, you know, images of that, this, this sort of cart image on the side, again, sorry, it's not, um, it's sort of blurry on the screen, um, is from a woman being hung and they would kind of design these carts to be at the right height so they could kind of wheel her up, put the noose on, pull it away. Um, it was, it was just wild. Um, and some places were more into burning witches, some were more into hanging, but, it was um, also paired with, I'm sorry, sorry, this is a lot and intense to talk about, but there was just a lot of sexual assault and, and violence happening. Um, that really the sort of idea of femininity that we have now, this sort of modest, um, more docile, whatever traditional femininity um, came from <clears throat> subjugation over hundreds of years. And for me, I didn't know this. And, um, and as a person of European descent, I was just like, holy crap. Um, and to understand that then this was sort of, during this period also, a lot of things were shifted in relationships with women, um, where a lot of things that we would have been compensated for, we weren't anymore. And there was a sort of, I can't describe it because Silvia Federici is like, a genius scholar and I'm a weirdo artist researcher, but um, essentially a lot of capital um, uh, was um, was taken out of women's laborers, uh, women's labor and women's bodies that was kind of able to make Europe rich enough to then be able to launch that colonization. So there's a real distinct and wild connection between the bubonic plague, early capitalism, persecution of women and colonization. Um, mind blowing. That's why this book, um, you know, I, it's taken a long time to even be able to summarize it that much. But um, this is just some of the images from my research. Um, this thing on the left here is called a scold's bridle. Um, if your wife or someone was bothering you talking too much or saying stuff you didn't feel like hearing, you could just put this thing on her head. Um, a little thing went over her tongue, lock her on, and you could parade her around for fun. Um, but there was just, there's a lot of repression that was pretty extreme. Um, and these are, these are images from some of those things. Oops, that one's, sorry, going backwards. Um, so anyway, fast forward to, um, I was asked to do this installation at Brick Media Arts um, in Brooklyn as part of their biennial. Um, and I just wanna point out that, just to get it out of the way now, that the things on the wall hanging with rope are supposed to be dresses. If you see anything else, that is a weird coincidence. I was not trying to bring genitalia specifically into this installation, but I have to address it because it um, always comes up. But um, I basically made this installation trying to process all this stuff I was learning um, of a medieval torture chamber. So this is based on a painting um, from the 1300s that I found. Um, you can see this top of this sort of tower here is where the woman's head and hands would have been. Um, the fire, the chains, you know, the hangings. Um, and then in the corner, you'll see this book. Um, also, I should say, same with all of my other work I've shown you tonight, paper mache, cardboard, joint compound, lumpy handsy, um, makery quality to these things. Um, and this crazy bright color that I recognize as sort of jarring with the intensity of some of the subject matter, um, which I guess I should address now. Um, I've always used this really bright color and I'm really drawn to bright color. And so in school, you know, people are always like, you can't just say you like it, you know, talk, 
give us some, you know, and I, and I always wasn't sure at first. Um, and then I realized that there was something sort of like a little bit of a, like, fuck you to the like preciousness and seriousness and, um, sort of patriarchal intellectualism of things that I experienced in art within academia a lot of the times. And I felt like this bright color just sort of was a little bit of a bratty thing to that. Um, and I, and then I read this book called Chromophobia by, um, David Bachelor that um, really broke down uh, sort of art historical understanding of color as something that is associated with the feminine, the queer, the quote crazy, um, uh, with people of color, with um, all sorts of different groups that are sort of um, uh, at people attempt to control them in the systems that we're in. So, so I learned that there actually is a sort of um, art historical precedents for, for this. But I also like the sort of double take that happens where you're like, it's bright and cheery, but something's wrong. You know, I feel a little, something's a little off. Um, so that's kind of why a lot of this color is here. Um, now the, the image on the right here that you're seeing, um, it says Malleus Maleficarum. Um, correction actually first published not in 1520, like it says, but 1484, I believe. Um, but this book was the second most published book um, to the Bible in Europe in its time. Um, everybody who had books was likely to have a copy of this book. Um, and it's basically a witch hunting um, manual, how to figure out who a witch is, how in gory, very gory, almost fetishistic detail, how to torture her and how to force confessions and find other witches. Um, so this is something that was really like, it wasn't just, um, I used to think that the witch trials were like that thing that happened for five minutes in Salem, um, you know, here, but actually it was 300 years and much more extensive. So um, I was just, I just made this project to try to get that information out there and, and kind of use my work as an excuse to have a conversation. So here you'll see another panel, um, another example of how you can get like a sort of like star academic smarty pants person to come and be part of your project. The person on the bottom right here is actually Silvia Federici, the woman who wrote the book. Um, she's super kind of like punk and down and will come to any DIY space and project and just talk about this stuff at length. Um, so I brought her in with another historian um, and then with a sexologist, um, the woman on the right of me um, to the left. Um, so like a Clark, she studies um, sensuality and, and um, sexology and kind of like the idea of um, different ways that we can um, approach understanding the body um, from a more like expansive and loving place. So I wanted to bring that in because a lot of Sylvia's text also talks about um, different understandings of the body um, and, and what we would call the female body. Um, and then also um, a midwife, um, the person speaking in the middle there, Inanna, she um, is a midwife, works primarily with women of color. And she was talking about the, the way that the stigma from this period in the text connects to today and her experience as a midwife. So I was trying to um, bring in this important history that I didn't know, and then also make it like relevant and engaging um, conversations about things that were happening today um, in different fields. So had a panel there. Um, then I made this um, solo exhibition in Baltimore, same, same subject matter, just trying to work through it. This is my first mural painting. Um, you can see the the dresses being, you know, representing the people who were burned in the fires, the same torturing device, the nooses. It's a little intense, but that's my first mural. Um, and in this exhibition, there was also um, this video called Witchual, um, which was kind of thinking about what a queer fertility ritual would look like. Queering fertility, since fertility was such an emphasis in the text. Um, so to make this, um, I basically had my friend who's an amazing performer, Rose Hernandez, um, dress up and be a sort of live maypole, um, like a human maypole. Because, you know, maypoles, a lot of us maybe did those dances when we were younger, but they're actually um, fertility dances. Um, and you're kind of like wrapping the pole in this sort of like sexy way that makes children doing that a little weird. But um, so basically we had a sort of queer version of that and we slowly wrap her in the video um, and then eventually um, lower her into this alive, wrapped into this grave um, and, and bury her. So the idea of sort of regeneration and, um, and thinking about sacrifice and transcendence. Um, so these were all sort of different ways of, of thinking about the same, the same book. Um, and I think I don't have the video here um, I'll end with um, this last project, which is also in that exhibition. 
um, called All the World Must Suffer a Big Jolt. Um, and I was thinking a lot about how I keep making these big crazy things and I actually don't have money for storage a lot of the times or I get exhausted putting them together. So how can I do something smaller um, and, uh, and kind of more manageable? And what happens if I'm not having to email 100 million people to be part of my project um, all the time and, and to kind of play with something else? So I built this small diorama um, with these little holes in it where my hands could come in and out and play with these props. And it was sort of like, a fictionalized story based on that text um, where I was um, with little bits of the text that and stuff that I had written uh, interspersed and the sort of idea that these these ancestral beings in, in the sky were watching these things that were happening on earth um, and kind of like an intergalactic version of the story across time. It's hard to describe, but um, but it was also fun to just try and do a different thing. And it's sort of inspired what I'm working on finishing now, which is a video where after that, I actually built a much larger diorama and um, and all of these different sets inside of it, thinking this was gonna be easier than a big installation. Um, it, it wasn't, <laughs> but, um, but there are all these different sets and, and sort of um, right now I'm thinking about this idea of the imagination as the new common. So in, in Federici's text, she talks about the, the enclosures when common lands in parts of Europe were enclosed and poor people were not able to share these sort of spaces for celebration and harvesting and hunting anymore. Um, so thinking about what our um, sort of commons of today would be that's under threat. I feel like it's um, it's the human imagination. So many of us are just sort of vegging out and absorbing content. We aren't left to sort of daydream and really um, uh, be present and activate our imaginations in the same way. Um, and in part, because I know that I've been like a workaholic busy machine, like go, 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 go forever um, to kind of hustle my career to where it's been. Um, I come from a more working class background and, and it took a lot of work to get here. Um, and I was really feeling weighed down by that. Um, and so also thinking about the way that, that our relationship to work affects the imagination um, and how we kind of in this political moment have been so just like saying no to stuff all the time that we don't have time to think about what we wanna say yes to. So um, those are some big ideas, but they're floating around in this video. Um, and maybe I'll have even finished a draft of it by the end of this program. Um, I'm, I'm really narrowing in on it and I can share it with you guys. Um, there's a part where I'm dressed up like a kind of hot topic store uh, punk from the mall. And I end up like getting lowered in on a swing onto this business suit made out of paper mache and then beating it up with a carrot that I got from a carrot off a stick. It's pretty ridiculous. Um, but feels like fun to be doing something weird and sort of a little bit less linear um, and logical than some of some of the other projects that um, I've needed to do that were more sort of directly community, community oriented. So um, I'll leave it with that. Um, it covered a lot of ground, but in sum, um, it's a really important time to make art. We need you guys to make art. Um, and I think that um, hopefully this can be kind of, you know, these are some ideas of how you might be able to create the space that you need that, that you need to see in the world to, to create the changes that you guys believe in. Um, and thank you so much. And I guess I'll, I'll stop my share now. Love to hear if anybody has any questions. That was so exciting. Thanks, Anza. Yeah, so feel free to turn your videos back on. And that yeah. I've Sorry, got a whole list, but let's get some other folks. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my internet broke up for a second, but we're doing questions, right? Okay, great. <laughs> Do I look at the questions? Is that how it happens on the in the chat? If you want to, or I can read them. There's one from Maria that says, can you list some of your medieval sources? Medieval sources, it sounds so cool. Um, the truth is right now, not off the top of my head, I have a file of a bunch of them, but if you, um, actually, I think that book is in this library. Let me really quickly see if I can find it. Um, this is not my library, there it is. Um, let's see, so 
sort of moved on to my next obsessions. But um, basically, if you look through this book, there are all sorts of um, incredible images and also like sources where you can follow them um, to other things. I also just got that book, the terrible book, Malleus Maleficarum. Um, you can get it for like $4 on the internet um, with a weird cover. And so I read that too, read parts of it. It's pretty gruesome. Elaine is saying that they're struck by um, all the different types of people. Like, how do I how do I find those partnerships? Um, that's a great question. And truthfully, it's a little bit different every time. Um, but a lot of it is just conversation. I just start asking my friends um, who they know um, and start reaching out. I um, feel like I could do a whole other talk and, and maybe I don't even know if it would be that right on but um about how you approach people um but I've, I've reached out to a lot of people via email or i'll have our friends if you have a friend in common um connect to connect me to folks but also like looking at organizations um but it's really just like a rabbit hole of of, of conversations and noodly um internet research to kind of end up um finding somebody. And then, and then often, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, I really hope this person will meet with me. And they're super excited to talk about it if it's something important to them. Um, but, but again, always, always approaching it, being mindful of like who you are, who they are, um, and, and what kinds of different factors might um, be important to consider when you're approaching asking somebody to do something for you or be part of your project and um, always having like a lot of humility in that. And I usually just start with like, can we get coffee and talk about a project? Um, you know, as opposed to saying like, will you be in my thing? I'm, you know, just to start a relationship. Um, yeah. How did I originally start working with cardboard and paper mache? Well, um, part of it is that I was broke um, and cardboard is easy to find. Um, and then part of it was I used to be kind of, well, I, I lived in the top of a tree for a little while. I was a literal tree hugger. And so I found myself suddenly um, making sculpture and feeling really confused about the materiality behind that. I still feel some complications around it. but. Um, so some of it was about that. And then also, um, honestly, I was, um, I love VCU. There's a few VCU people here. I had some good experiences there, but our tech in the shop at the time was a total like super bro. Um, he made it really uncomfortable to, to go into that shop. And so at first I was super excited to be making things with wood and kind of pumping things out. And, um, and then he, I just felt scared to go into the shop. We had such a I, I think I might, I said something I shouldn't have said to him, not knowing that he had a big attitude. He, I said, I think I need someone with less attitude to help me, please. <laughs> They're like, just didn't go over very well. So, um, so honestly, some of it was an adaptation. Um, I, I could make things out of cardboard without, um, without having to um, need any fancy access to tools or, um, or whatever. So some some of it was just adapting, you know, and, and that circles back to the um, making art while the world is on fire class, you know, um, really good things can come out of adapting to shitty situations, right? Um, like becoming a cardboard nerd. Um, still looking. Ayana has a question. Hey, uh, hey, Megan. Thanks Hi. for that talk. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. I like this voice thing. It feels better. <laughs> awesome. Um, I was just thinking about your response to the question about collaboration and, and participation, uh, folks participating. Mm -hmm. And you kind of positioned it in this way that I really like when you said, um, I think about kind of who I am in relation to the other person. Yeah. And um, I think that's a really good thing to consider um, for students. And I'm thinking about the earlier th the earlier uh, issue you were kind of thinking through around talking about issues in relation to your work, mm -hmm. and and you phrase this this thing that I that that I often try to kind of flag, um, especially in my teaching when students ask like, do I have permission to right. address X? Right, right. right. Um, and I think that the 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 question of like 
yourself, your position in a relation to someone else is a great way to begin to answer that, right? right. Because sometimes yeah. we actually have more agency and power than we realize um, when we don't ask that question. So in terms of immigration, for example, I think it's interesting to position the acknowledgement that as a citizen, you have access and privilege right. that maybe right. the undocumented doesn't have. Um, yeah. And then thinking about like, well, so then what does that arm me to do, right? Yeah. Um, for some, it might mean, you know, I'm a white bodied person, I can shield a person who's right. you know, a brown or black bodied person when they're protesting, because I know that law enforcement will value my body over that brown or black person's body, right? right? Exactly. So I think that question, I mean, I think the way you responded to the participation and collaboration right. um, for students is really good to think about like, who am, who am I? And not just this kind of abstract, like what can I or can't I do? Right. Because depending on your position, you actually might yeah. have a lot of power and it's yeah. just about recognizing yourself in relation to that power. I think that's a really good point and I'm glad you brought it up because it also makes me think about that term that I use permission specifically, like it feels maybe loaded because it's like, who am I getting permission from? Is it from myself? Is it from other people? All of that. And I think another way to say what that is in terms of especially that moment with like, you know, DACA and the climate accord and all that stuff, like, and ultimately being like, okay, a platform, like I can use my privilege and who I am as a human to like make this platform and maybe get people to come listen to people who speak from that platform. And that felt more like, like, so the question is like, what would be like the most, um, as opposed to like, cause we were talking about this in my class last night, like self permission and like mm -hmm. self criticism and, and all of that. But like, what would be like the most like impactful, exciting, um, like effective use of who I am, my story, what I have access to, to affect X, Y, Z or something. Cause then it's less about like, do I have permission to talk about this? Or is it like, am I the most effective person to talk about this? And if, if so, like why and how, you know? Um, yeah. And, and, and again, that's what I really love about the kind of simplicity of who am I yeah. in relation <laughs> to who I'm, you know, as you say, oh, right. Yeah. Because, because in that way, um, you know, it, it might not fix or, or solve the issue, but, but it does force you to account for your place in the country and in yeah. the world, right? Yeah, um, exactly. And, and, and after doing that, you might decide, I, I want a position that says activism, my artwork's right. gonna do something else. Or yep. here's the way that my artwork can add to that, you know? Yes, um, totally. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to kind of just follow up on that. I love that. And I think right now, especially because um, I know in your class too, we're talking about like what it means to be making art right now. And I feel like these questions like are always important, but especially right now. For sure. You know, sure. real relevant. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. If anybody else wants to ask a question with their voice, that's my preferred method, but also excited to read it in the chat. <laughs> Mary has a question. I like the like typing question and then have <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. I just made this note that you have this like kind of flow um, as you go into collaborative or um, participatory practice. Um, I love this question that you have in there. How can we establish trust? seems like sort of related to like, who am I and who are you? But right. it's, it feels like um, this next step. And I'm curious about how you do actually establish trust. Um, you can talk about how, I love that you put that question in there. It's like such yeah. a big question for me. Like, how do you do it? Yeah, yeah, thanks for, I mean, for asking that question. And I think I should say, I'm definitely not an expert every time I'm like figuring it out. And I don't think there's like a formula, you know? Um, but I think a lot of, um, in the ideal world, right? Like in my ideal self, like I'm thinking a lot about um, that who I am, what's this project, like looking at my own stuff and like what I'm bringing to a, a moment. And like, if I can, I can feel in my body, if I'm 
approaching somebody in a way that feels like transactional, like a, I'm trying to get something out of them thing. Um, and that's something I just try to like monitor and check in myself. Cause sometimes you're like, I want to put on this project and I really want this person to come and talk and like, because they're going to be amazing and et cetera. But, and it can kind of get a little bit confusing, but I think like being really, um, again, when I'm slow and doing my best self, like being really present with where you're at entering it. Um, and then I think that for me, it's about like, again, approaching somebody to have coffee in a conversation before asking them um, to do more or whatever. Um, and I think um, for me, it, it, it totally this is such a good question. It's hard to answer because it totally depends on who I'm trying to establish trust with and like what their distrust might be about um, and also what my own might be. Because honestly, I've had a couple of people participate in the project that have been, you know, didn't show up the day of, um, or like, you know, these things and that, that I'm, I'm also vulnerable and extending something in the relationship. Um, but I think so much of it is about just having like open conversations with people ahead of time and, and actually building some relationship with them before you start engaging in the next thing. Um, but I think that's such a good question. I just have to think about, you know, about it more. Um, I know we're getting close to time. I don't want to keep people over because I'm sure everybody's also like what's happening with the coup. Um, but if anybody else has questions, I'm happy to answer. Yes, I can I can actually um, I can post those questions. Sorry, seeing Allison's question here. I can post them and also if um, Enza's cool with it, you could even um, post the slides from this to the um, the base camp or whatever, so people can have it. I don't think it's a lack of questions, at least for myself. I, I'm just like digesting so much. So I'm just really appreciative. Thank you. I'm glad there's stuff to digest. It's, it's a good thing. And also we have the rest of um, our time together and our lives. Um, so we don't have to figure it all out right now. And I'm just grateful for you guys spending the time um, with my work on this night of all nights. Looks like Eliza has a, a question, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, um, you have these three different projects that you showed us that have a lifespan where they are iterated in different spaces and um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about when you decide to finish a project and move That's on. a great question. I don't know. And I was just thinking about it today. And also I'm really appreciating your overall um, green and yellow vibe that's happening. It's really good. Um, <laughs> as a color nerd. Um, I don't know. I, I was just I was just sending something um, in an application out today. And I thought, you know, I think the the press conference might be done, you know, um, it's, it's run a bunch. Um, it's done, it's, I've done it eight times. Um, and uh, I don't know that, I mean, a lot of these things are still important, but I don't feel like the attacks on the press and everything are quite the same right now as when I started that project. And also, frankly, like, I don't want to be like Groundhog's Day with the same project forever. Um, and I, I like that project in some ways, and there's some things that I feel pretty critical about it. Um, particularly, I just feel like I question remaking those symbols um, and not changing them in more of a way. You know, um, it, it felt sort of a little bit like we need this thing, I think, so I'm going to make it. Um, and so I think that that one might be done. Um, but I think it's also like like the Dyke Bar. I think it's done sometimes, but then somebody else somewhere says, can we do that project again? Um, and so I've, I kind of keep, there's like, is the pro there's, I guess there's two questions. Like, is something done for me as an artist in terms of my engagement with it? And then also, is there still a need for it in the world if there is a need for it? Um, and so I think with the Dyke Bar, the next time I do it, and if I'd been in Sydney, like we had planned, I was gonna get to do a whole local Australian version. I was really excited about. Um, COVID ruined stuff, but um, but to kind of make sure that the project stays alive inside me. If I'm bored of doing it again, that's probably a good sign that it's time to finish it um, or 
change it in some way. So the next time I do the dike bar, if I do it again, I want to do some programming I haven't gotten to do yet um, and switch it up some. Um, so yeah, the good question. As we wrap up kind of the formal part of this, I'm going to share a little bit more. So think of any last questions you want to pop in here. Um, we've mentioned there are more public programs that are happening with this residency. They're happening basically every day at Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. So if you <laughs> want more there is more um, logan posted our eventbrite which is where you can find out the details to those and i'll put that again in the chat so we'd love to see you tomorrow night or tomorrow morning i'm sorry pacific standard time we have joseph delap the next day we have rodney ewing in the afternoon and then we've got a break over the weekend and come back for more artist lectures midway thesis and another artist lecture so we've got you covered come back for more um, are there any last questions for Megan before we kind of end the formal part of this programming? I'm just reading through all of your comments, you guys. Thank you for all of these. Okay, I'm going to stop our recording. So that kind of closes out the official part.